Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Um, so let's immerse. Um, chapter five, as we um, discussed last week, and if you weren't able to join us, the archived recording is on my YouTube channel, which uh, Natalie sends out a message from me every week so that you can follow the link directly to the uh, class. Every class that we've done so far has been archived. Um, so we're reading from chapter five of Pirkei Avot. I have my trusty Koran edition in front of me, and in a moment, I'll put the Safari online. A couple of distinguishing features of chapter five so that the text will look, sound, feel less familiar, um, but it is intended, like all of Pirkei Avot, to be easily inculcated, memorized, internalized. Um, the chapter is structured along numeric mnemonics, focusing on axioms that are framed in quantities of 10, then seven, and then four. I think it goes in descending numeric order. So we're focusing right now on a series of statements that use the number 10 as the mnemonic. 10 such and so. And then, and I've been reflecting on this both from last week and in preparation for today, where 10 uh, continues to figure prominently at the top of our class. You'll see more statements in quantities of 10. Um, somebody helpfully pointed out that 10 being the number of our fingers makes a very helpful counting mnemonic that if you, you know, you can just do this and uh, get to 10. Um, and it also seems to me that this was a kind of shorthand for memorization of key rabbinic concepts that were not actually written down in the Torah, right? So what we're looking at here kind of resides in uh, Agabic Midrash. Let me explain my terminology. Um, midrash is not a book, although sometimes it is erroneously referred to as a book. Go look, it's in the Midrash, as if you could go to a Jewish library or a bookstore and say, hey, I'm looking for a copy of the Midrash. Anyone who's in the know, your bookseller, your librarian will, will give you a funny look because there's no just one book called the Midrash. In fact, it doesn't take the definite article properly. It should just say in Midrash, though you will often hear somebody say in the Midrash, to which the only correct response is which Midrash? Midrash is rather a genre of Jewish uh, sacred literature. Um, I say sacred, which is probably an, uh, an exaggerated adjective because I'm not convinced that its authors saw it as, I'm not sure its authors understood any difference between sacred and secular pursuits. There was just Judaism. Everything mm -hmm. is a sacred pursuit the way I understand how Judaism operates. In any case, Midrash is a genre of rabbinic literature, meaning it is literature uh, developed and uh, expounded, promulgated by the rabbis. They do take a definite article, um, simply meaning the generations across centuries of sages who expounded the biblical tradition. So Midrash has I would say a working definition is that Midrash uh, expounds on biblical text and creates new meaning out of a cross product of the biblical text and the rabbinic imagination. Um, there are some who would erroneously, again, describe Midrash as an effort in exegesis. Exegesis meaning to draw out of the text new meaning. I would, I think more properly, define Midrash as an effort in eisegesis, E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S, -E -E -S -S, meaning to read into a text a new meaning. Is this just a semantic difference? Perhaps, um, but I think that I I'll stick to it because it can be, I think, rightly argued that the meanings that the rabbis claim to draw out of the text 
aren't actually in the text. At best, they are, as I just said, a cross product between the biblical text and the rabbinic imagination. And I, in my reading of Midrash, generally choose to put the emphasis on the rabbinic imagination. So what we're really looking at is, is a kind of uh, a layered history of interpretation, right? The, the Torah text had a meaning that its authors had in mind when they composed it. And, uh, and of course, it's a composite work, like all Jewish literature, like all Jewish sacred literature, most Jewish sacred literature is composite, meaning many authors over much time. The Torah itself is composite, but the authors of the Torah had in mind what they wanted their writing to mean, and the community for whom it was intended assigned its own meaning to it in its original context. But because these texts were canonized, that is to say, preserved as sacred literature for a religious community over much, much time, the rabbis who were the heirs to this literature, who inherit the literature from those ancestors who had preserved it, most likely a priestly scribal class working in the in or around the temple compound in the last centuries before the common era. The rabbis, you will recall, are the successors to the Pharisaic class of Jewish leaders, scholars, philosophers, you might call them, um, interpreters of the tradition. And the Pharisees have a very expansive view of Jewish tradition that begins with the biblical root text, but includes Pharisaic or later rabbinic interpretation of the text. Now, all of this is a long way of saying that in the course of the rabbinic interpretive uh, literature, in the course of making and canonizing its own rabbinic literature, which takes as its root the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, but expounds on it, there are many different forms that rabbinic literature will take. Mishnah, the Mishnah, is one such early example. Um, and again, the Mishnah itself is often miscategorized as a law code. I think if you're reading Pirkei Avot, there's, you don't even need me to tell you this, there's ample proof that it's not a law code. There's nothing about Pirkei Avot that resembles a law code. And if you were with us all the way from the very beginning of our Mishnah study, when we did Mishnah Shabbat, the mm -hmm. entire Mishnah uh, Tractate Shabbat, uh, not Tractate, yeah, Tractate Shabbat, yeah, some of it is legal in orientation. It tells you how to do uh, Judaism, and how not to do Judaism, but it isn't a law code per se. It's, it's a much more discursive, uh, dialogic kind of collection of rabbinic statements. And that's why I've called this class Mishnah colon, the building blocks of Jewish life. I think that's a more accurate description of what Mishnah is trying to do. It's trying to provide a, a, a bayit, a, a house, a structure for living Jewishly. Um, Midrash is its own genre of literature. So there are aspects of Mishnah and Talmud that are more or less Midrashic in form and content. Pirkei Avot chapter five is highly Midrashic. Now, now here I'm actually taking this long preamble and trying to connect the dots for you, right? So as I was reflecting on what I wanted to say at the beginning of class today, I wanted to highlight that Pirkei Avot chapter five has a kind of common DNA with other Midrash in that it begins with, uh, or it attempts to expound biblical text and provide imaginative rabbinic responses to the text or expansions of the text. One elegant metaphor for how to understand what the genre of literature known as Midrash is and does is to invite the reader to consider the oyster. The oyster um, produces uh, a pearl, which is a thing uh, that 
is valuable. We've assigned value to the pearl. But the genesis of a pearl is a small particle of rock or grit or sand that the oyster uh, regards as an irritant. And so a little piece of grit or sand or a pebble gets into under the shell of the oyster and irritates the soft flesh of the oyster. And the biological response of the oyster is to secrete a substance that hardens in layers around this little particle. And in the process, it isolates the particle. It makes it no longer irritating to the oyster and happens to produce a thing of beauty and value. In like fashion, it has been said, Midrash is the pearl that the rabbis have created around a surface irritant in the biblical text. So the way the rabbis frame Midrash is, I'm reading Torah, oh, here's a thing that bothers me, that intrigues me, that leaves me with questions that I want to ask of the text, or just as, or even more often, prompts me to go on flights of rabbinic imagination so that I can add meaning on top of the layer, the foundation layer of the biblical text. I can create new meaning. But the rabbis want you to believe that it's just something in the text itself that is bothering them. And they create this pearl of wisdom to share with the rest of the Jewish community. As we go, we may have opportunities to see in Pirkei Avot chapter five, how Midrashic thinking informs this section of Pirkei Avot. The other thing that came to mind between last week and this week that I wanted to share with you, and thank you for the, the extensive discourse at the beginning of our study, and then we'll take some questions before we dive in. Um, the other thing that occurred to me is that last week I said we have kind of moved away from the obvious telltale signs that Pirkei Avot is a handbook by rabbis for their disciple rabbis. I'm going to recant on that statement and say, the more I thought about it, the more I recognize that it is entirely possible that Pirkei Avot chapter five is actually trying to do the same thing, but it's a little bit different in form and structure. I believe what may be happening here is that the the rabbis who are writing the text, and Pirkei Avot chapter five is also distinctive because it does not attribute these statements to any one rabbi, which is in and, it's in and of itself significant. They are in the voice of what I called last week, the stam of the Talmud, which means the simple unnamed or anonymous narrative voice that kind of fills in the, the different strands of thought and writing in the Talmud itself. And Pirkei Avod is Talmud. All Mishnah is the core of Talmud. So in Talmud, the voice of the anonymous Stam narrator, known just simply as Stam, is the voice that uh, presents chapter five of Pirkei Avot. But it still seems to me that these teachings may have been designed for young rabbis in training to access in a kind of quick uh, quick access of their memory banks, a whole bunch of rabbinic midrash on biblical texts simply through these mnemonics because they're written in this kind of shorthand. So last week, 10 generations from uh, Adam to Noah and 10 generations from Noah to Abraham um, in order to demonstrate how long suffering God is or was, right? God created humanity, the first thing they do is they run amok, they, they uh, you know, Cain slays his brother Abel, it doesn't get much better after that, um, God des decides to bring a flood, the people come off the ark, the first thing Noah does is he gets rip-roaring drunk and exposes himself, and then the Tower of Babel, and God kind of, I can just see God like this, uh, but rather than despairing entirely of his creation and, and crumpling it up forever, God decides to move on and give a covenant to Abraham who will pursue justice and righteousness. And that becomes the response to the inherent uh, flawed nature of humanity. Um, all of this, the rabbis say, 
is a way of demonstrating how long suffering God is. It may be that the reference to the 10 generations was a prompt for the young rabbi in training to go back to the Tanakh and memorize all of the names of the 10 generations from Adam to Noah and the next 10 from Noah to Abraham. And similarly, we're going to see more of these statements of 10. And I believe that they were, I could have, I'm imagining a scenario where the master teacher at the front of the yeshiva would say to his disciples, okay, Shmulek, in the back row, tell us the 10 things that were made on the eve of Shabbat at the first creation. And none of these things are in Tanakh. They all reside in the kind of collective memory bank of rabbinic midrash. All right. That's a very long introduction. It took me about 15 minutes. Um, I'd like to take any questions or comments before we dive into the next Mishnah in chapter five. One question in the chat window, the, uh, the WRJ talk is being recorded. Any questions on what I've just said? Well, that means I was much more clear than I thought I was, so. Okay. We have on our screen uh, coming up Pirkei Avot chapter five, starting at Mishnah four. Um, and again, uh, if you were, even if you weren't with us last week, I think my, my overlong preamble should set us up here. Okay. So Asara, Asara is, is just 10 in Hebrew, 10 Asara. Sometimes in the masculine form, you'll see it uh, as Eser. Eser Asara. Asara Nisim, that's the word for miracles. You may know it from the Hanukkah dreidel. Um, the nun of the dreidel is Nes Gadol Hayasham. Nes Gadol, a great miracle. A Nes is a miracle happened there. But if you're in Israel, you can get a dreidel that says Nes Gadol Hayapo. A great miracle happened here. So that's a good souvenir. If you're in Israel, bring home for your, for your little ones in your life. Uh, in Israeli dreidel. Nisim is just the plural of nes. So asara nisim, 10 miracles, na'asu were made or wrought, la'avotenu, b'mitzrayim, ve'asara al-hayam. 10 miracles were wrought for our ancestors in Egypt and 10 at the sea. Okay, so what are the 10 miracles that were wrought for the Israelites in Egypt? This is an easy question. It is not a trick question. Anyone can raise a hand or unmute and answer that one. The 10 plagues. The 10, the 10 plagues, right. And it's interesting how they are cast, first and foremost, as miracles for the Jewish people, as opposed to first and foremost, acts of you know, shock and awe, <coughs> terror and destruction on the Egyptian population, right? So 10 miracles were wrought for our ancestors, and then 10 at the sea. Now, again, here's one where if you don't know a lot of rabbinic midrash, you may not know the miracles at the sea. I certainly did not have those at my fingertips. This was one of those things where like, oh yeah, vaguely, I think I've heard a tradition that not only were there 10 plagues, which were cast as God's miracles for the Jewish people in Egypt. Also, when they escaped on the night of the 10th plague and Pharaoh finally re relented, they come to the sea. And of course, now Pharaoh has reneged he and his armies are chasing after the Israelites with chariots and horses. The Israelites arrive at the sea. The miracle of the sea splitting is performed uh, for the Israelites by God with the hand of Moses outstretched over the waters. And then, and then enter rabbinic midrash, right? Enter the rabbi's own imaginative flights of fancy where they say not only were there 10 plagues, everyone knows that because that's the biblical text. In the Midrashic imagination, there were 10 more miracles that happened at the sea. And these just, I think, become avenues or opportunities for, again, folkloric Midrashic flights of fancy. Fortunately, Safaria provides us with this very helpful sidebar commentary. Um, so I'll put this, I think you should be able to see this on screen, right? Not if you can, on the right-hand side. All right, so 10 miracles were wrought for our ancestors in Egypt and 10 at the sea. The 10 miracles that were wrought for our ancestors in Egypt were they're being spared from the 10 plagues that were afflicted upon the Egyptians. In other words, it, I don't even think that the miracles were there being spared. I would simply say the miracles were the plagues 
and doubly miraculous that in every instance of a plague, the text makes clear that, but the Israelites had water that did not turn to blood. The Israelites were not afflicted by frogs. The Israelites had light in their homes during the plague of darkness. And of course, it was only the Egyptian firstborn that perished on the night of the 10th plague. The 10 miracles that were performed at the sea are not mentioned in the Torah, but are contained in a midrash, right? So here, the mnemonic is the invitation for the student of Pirkei Avot to go back and commit to memory all of these traditions that aren't in the Torah. They are listed as follows by the Rambam. So fortunately, Maimonides, one of whose great uh, exegetical projects, he would have called it exegetical. I'm going to call it eisegetical. <laughs> exegetical meaning drawing meaning out, eisegetical meaning reading meaning in. Rambam, by the way, is Maimonides, right? The great 13th century sage from Spain who uh, forced migrated to North Africa, eventually becoming basically the chief rabbi of Cairo. And uh, I think he died in, uh, in, in Cairo. But no, he made it to the Holy Land. He's buried in Israel. In any case, one, that the sea was split. Okay, that's kind of obvious. Two, the water formed a tent over their heads. Three, the land became firm so that they didn't like get sucked into quicksand. When the Egyptians tried to cross the land in the, in the sea, it returned to being muddy. So the Egyptians got snared. The sea was split into 12 strips so that each tribe could travel separately. I bet you didn't know that. That one really cracks me up. There's a separate lane for every tribe. To, why? I don't know. It's Midrash. I mean, I can see, I'm not even looking at him, but Russell rolls his eyes at Midrash because sometimes, you know, imaginative and fanciful just becomes, I don't know, uh, I'm Super, using it, superstition. Super, okay, thank you. I knew you'd have a word for it. Um, so 12 strips so that each tribe had its own, like the, the original LA freeway. The water froze and became hard as a rock. The water which became as a rock was actually many rocks and was beautifully arranged. <laughs> so the, a miracle upon a miracle 10 times. The water remained clear so that the tribes could see each other so that it wasn't a, an opaque wall of ice it was a perfectly transparent lanes, uh, 12 lanes of uh, ice, perfectly transparent so that the tribes could look across and see each other crossing to freedom. Nine, water that was fit for drinking leaked from the side. So this is an answer to, must have taken a long time to cross the sea. How did they have enough water? Water that was fit for drinking leaked from the sides. And after they finished drinking the water, the water that was left immediately again froze. And therefore, the Egyptians couldn't make it. All right. The 10 plagues that were, well, that were wrought upon the Egyptians are, commentator continues, in Egypt are well known and listed in the Torah. The 10 plagues at the sea are, according to some commentators, the 10 different verbs used. So this is a totally different interpretation of what exactly are the 10 plagues at the sea. Not the 10 plagues, the 10 miracles at the sea. Um, and apparently, if you count it, though counting in rabbinic math is always a bit of a wiggly affair. There are just times when you, your counting won't line up with what the uh, rabbis counted. 10 verbs are used to describe how the Egyptians perished at the sea, which is chapter 15 of Exodus. As it says here, God has thrown, God has cast, the deeps covered them, they went down into the depths, God dashes in pieces the enemy. You, meaning God, overthrow them that rise up against you. It, meaning God's wrath. This is the song at the sea. This is the famous uh, song that Moses leads and Miriam leads with her timbrel. And it says all the Israelites sang along. And it's this epic poem. And it's formatted in this very interesting kind of uh, delineation of interlocking lines with a uh with with a kind of, it kind of looks like this if you're looking at the Torah. have you ever seen chapter 15 of exodus the song at the sea it's instantly recognizable just by the way it's formatted on the parchment uh god's wrath consumes them meaning the egyptians like straw the waters were piled up the floods 
stood upright as a heap and they sank as lead. Okay, so I'm not sure what else to make of this other than the, the mnemonic provides an opportunity for the student, the reader, to go back and commit to memory lots and lots and lots of folkloric or midrashic material that isn't directly in the Torah because that's what it is to be a master teacher of the Jewish tradition. You have to have a lot of text at your fingertips. And especially at this point in the evolution of the Jewish tradition and the Jewish people, not everyone has access to where these things are written down. And many of them may never have been written or may not yet have been written down. So uh, I think another conjecture that I'm making here is that for the rabbis and the rabbis in training, there was a, these uh, Mishnayot in chapter five are a kind of shorthand pointing to traditions that hadn't yet been written down and therefore were transmitted only orally and had to be committed to memory. Of course, that is mere speculation. We only can make claims about text that we actually have. Oral tradition, which is this much vaunted precursor to what gets written down, is a term that I almost always avoid because people will say, well, that must have been part of the oral tradition. And I'm like, okay, but that's all you can say because it's the oral tradition, the so-called, or I always call it the so-called oral tradition because we don't have it. The evidence is in um, the white space of the painting as it were, right? The evidence of an oral tradition is only through the fact that we have text that later gets, or that is written down and we are invited to ask the question of the text, Oh, text, where did you come from? Okay, Dad, you've got the hand up. Uh, two things, number one, this seems to me to be the origin of rabbinic math that we recite at the, in the Haggadah. Not the origin, but, uh, you know, but or, a sibling. It, it's, it, it's just part of a category of- it, I mean, it yeah. seems to be the referent of how we got to be, you know, there were tenfold, 10 plagues, et cetera, et cetera. Right, if you're really a Seder enthusiast and you do like a full-on Seder, then surely you are familiar with the passage that says, actually, how can we demonstrate that when God struck the Egyptians with the plagues, there were 50 plagues at the, uh, the 50 is one that I actually have committed to memory, right? So the thinking is because we learned that God afflicted the Egyptians with the hand of God, and a hand has five fingers, therefore each finger corresponds to a different attribute of God with which each plague was enacted upon the Egyptians, right? So anger, the messengers of evil, like each of the fingers of God casts the plague out on the Egyptians in a five-fold manner. It's more rabbinic math is your point. Okay. All right, my, my, my larger question is, since it seems to me that all cultures and all civilizations and all times have their own mythology. I mean, whether we're talking about the Iliad and the Odyssey of the Greeks or origin stories of Native Americans, how is Midrash different than mythology? None. <laughs> Period. I mean, in content, sure. But in, in terms of form and function, all of this literature in the aggregate comprises the mythology or the mythos, uh, or I just prefer capital M myth of the Jewish people. It is all the aggregated wisdom, um, some of which is profoundly inspiring, some of which is amusingly imaginative, and some of which is eye-rollingly superstitious. And all of those things are subjective evaluations, by the way. One person's imaginative flight of fancy is another person's life-changing wisdom is yet another person's nourishkeit, you know, val something valueless. Um, nevertheless, Torah itself is the great myth of the Jewish people, Tanakh, and then Midrash, is the, um, is the expansive commentary on it. So in, in my view, myth is just, myth is a positive term that describes the master story of a civilization. And we have a particularly 
Um, some would say fast and loose. Others would say expansive um, relationship with our original master story, meaning the Hebrew Bible. Um, I, I cherish the fact that the Jewish response to our master story was to constantly return to it and expand on it in order to make meaning upon meaning. Um, but there is no difference. I mean, yeah, the, the, the stories in the Tanakh tend to lean away from gods and heroes. There are some vague allusions to those kinds of mythic tales that are familiar, for instance, from Greek civilization, what have you, ancient other ancient Near Eastern civilizations, certainly the Sumerian epics, um, the Akkadian epics, the Assyrian epics, resemble parts of the Torah, the Noah story probably being the greatest example of a story, a mythos that is found in many other Near Eastern civilizations, literatures. So it's a different kind of mythos in that it is also uh, agglomerated with poetry, and uh, poetry would be consistent with other myth, myth, mythic structures, but law, in particular, law gets agglomerated into the Jewish mythos. And, and then, of course, the rabbis take this and build on it. The rabbis are creating their own myth atop the myth. Um, Russell, then Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for these explanations. What impresses me about Midrash is that some of it is rooted in logic. Like, how did they get drink? They, obviously, they needed drinking water. Some of it is rooted in imagination. And then imagination goes wild, sometimes positing the intervention of new characters who didn't appear in the original story, uh, new phenomena and the like. Right. Whether or not the difference between myth and story is faith. Hmm. Uh, if, you believe, if you have faith in these myths, they become story and they even become truth. So with that in mind, my question is, is all of Christianity Midrash? Um, Abraham Joshua Heschel once said that all of Torah is Midrash on what actually happened at Sinai. Now it's a brilliant, I'm gonna use this comment to answer your question, Russell. What Heschel was saying is that the literature about the event is just that, it is literature. And all literature that works, that means something to its authors and even more to its readers, works because it draws on conventions of storytelling that are a human invention, but should not be confused with the event itself. And I'll say more about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll detour to answer your question. Viewed this way, I would submit, yes, all of Christianity is midrash on the event of Jesus's ministry, suffering, death, crucifixion, and especially the, the resurrection, again, for the believer, right? But it's all midrash on what actually happened. What we never have access to once it is in the past is the event itself. Now, one can make certain inferences about the event itself in any literature that purports to be historic. How my, uh, sometimes I find it a useful exercise, a mental exercise, when I'm reading any kind of ancient literature, G uh, Torah, Tanakh, rabbinic literature, to visualize for myself just at the gut level, without so much uh, uh, rigorous analysis, how much does this literature strike me as a representation, a direct representation of the existential reality for the author? And how much of this is the author's imagination? The answer, of course, is that all literature that purports to be historic is to some degree a cross product. Even history books, by the way. History books 
fool us into thinking that they are teaching us history, when in fact what they are doing is they're making a midrash on the events as they occurred by creating a structure by which some kind of meaning can be ascribed to those events, which is why, again, I hate using this as an example, but it always, it, 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 it works because people have familiarity with it. Take an event like the Holocaust. Now, how can you write a history of the Holocaust? You can write the history of the Holocaust. That's not a rhetorical question. How, how literally could one write the history of the Holocaust? One could write it as a, small aspect of the geopolitics of World War II in Europe. One can write it as the final product of centuries of European anti-Semitism. One can write it chiefly as a psychological profile of Adolf Hitler or a psychological profile of quote unquote ordinary Germans and the susceptibility of ordinary people to demagogic ideologies. One can even, I would go so far as to say, tell the story of the Holocaust as a comedy. Now you might find that offensive, but that's not the point. Actually, uh, Roberto Benigni, many people think threaded the needle in the film, Life is Beautiful, which takes as its backdrop the Holocaust, but which is still designed to make the audience laugh and feel good. Um, Schindler's List tells the story of the Holocaust uh, through the virtue that wants to play up the virtue of a righteous Gentile. The point is that there are innumerable ways to tell the story of the Holocaust. None of them, however, is the event itself because the event itself is an amalgamation of so many different data points and that's why there will never cease to be new histories of the Holocaust being written. And the same is true for any phenomenon and Christianity is no exception. The rise of Christianity can be understood as a, or I should say the Christian scriptures themselves, especially the Pauline material, the material by the apostle Paul, which is usually written in the form of epistles, which is a famous, a, a, a fancy word for letters that Paul wrote to various communities to tell the story of the passion of the Christ, his Messiah, and to make known the salvation that can be obtained through faith in Jesus as Messiah, and especially in the four gospels and also the book of Acts. So the gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, which I'm presenting to you in their chronological order of composition, not the order in which they're in the Christian scriptures, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, written between the years 70, 72, and the early 100s of the common era, plus the book of Acts, which is ascribed to the same author as the book of the gospel of Luke. All of those are midrash. They are midrash on the life and times of Jesus. And they were written at a minimum 40 years after the death of Jesus, which tells you that they are not the event itself. And in fact, there's been so much time between the event itself and the writing of the gospels that they are um, definitively not history. But again, my, my larger point is that nothing that presents itself as history is actually history. Only history is history. Okay, an unnecessarily long answer to your question, but that's only because I love the question. Joe Levine. <laughs> I, I appreciated what Russell said. Thank you for calling on me. I really appreciated uh, Russell's comment. Uh, and of something that remind, uh, your father said, something that Doug said, reminded me to ask a question. Can you please remind me when the, when the Torah was allegedly first written? Sure. Um, well, nobody knows for sure, right? Um, but the the scholarly community that makes it makes it its business to analyze the data that we have that can be brought to bear on this question, which is a combination of many different scholarly disciplines, right? You've got linguistics. So by studying the language, syntax, grammar, and especially word forms, vocabularies 
of different parts of the Torah, and we're going to focus just on the five books, one can make certain conclusions as to whether or not a passage or chapter or section is relatively older or relatively more recent. That's just because these people have devoted their life and study to ancient Hebrew linguistics. And they know that, for instance, to use a, a particularly relevant example from today's study, Exodus chapter 15, the Song at the Sea, is written in a particular uh, form of Hebrew that almost everyone in the scholastic community agrees is more ancient. So some of the bits of poetry that make their way into the Torah may be as old as more than 1000 BCE from around the Davidic kingdom, King David, about 1000 before the common era. Some passages possibly even older than that, though the Torah itself purports to have um, the Exodus, according to most people, wants you to believe that it happened somewhere around 1200 to 1400 BCE. And that Abraham was somewhere between 1800 and 2000 BCE, but nobody knows these things for sure because they're all speculative. Um, so as for the writing of Torah itself, the oldest sections, which include Exodus chapter 15, bits and snatches of poetry, and especially what's called the covenant code, the ancient legal matters, or the legal code, it, it is a code, that occupies most of Exodus chapters 21, 22, and 23, and I think a little bit of 24, don't quote me on it. This part of the Torah is often regarded as the oldest of the old. And so linguistics is one method of analysis. Another is comparative literature, right? So if you're looking at Torah, you can find other ancient Near Eastern literatures and go, huh, that really looks and sounds a lot like the Code of Hammurabi. And because of the widespread um, availability of the Code of Hammurabi, even in antiquity, Scholars have a much better idea of when that law code was around. And so if you see certain laws in the, in the Jewish scripture, in the, in the Tanakh, in the Torah, that resemble things that you find in the Code of Hammurabi, you can begin to make some analytical conjectures about, aha, this must be indebted to, or in some way derivative of other more ancient literature. And that helps you frame it. The third is archeology. span Every now and then, archaeologists dig up a little fragment of pottery or a little, you know, papyrus doesn't last very long, uh, but a, generally something in ceramic um, or engraved in stone or metal. And every now and then a parchment, though my understanding is that the oldest parchments that contain the Torah are the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are generally dated to the first century of the Common Era when they were actually written down, that is not when the Torah was written. So probably the material of the five books of Moses itself is an amalgamation or um, an anthologization of literatures and documents composed between let's say 1000 BCE, maybe a little bit earlier and maybe 400 BCE. I'm, I tend to be uh, moved by the scholarly writing of the late daters. Generally, you have in, in biblical scholarship, late daters and early daters. Those are the people who believe that most of this literature coalesced and was redacted relatively early, 8th, 9th, 7th centuries BCE. I'm more in the camp of the late daters, the people who believe that a lot of the literature was composed, certainly anthologized and redacted, post-Babylonian exile. In my view, when I'm reading Torah, there are a number of different tells, right? A number of different showings of the hand where the Bible or the Torah appears to be influenced by the events of the Babylonian destruction and dispersion. At some other point, we can teach a class and, and learn more about that. Um, there's even a fascinating hypothesis, though it hasn't, you know, I don't, I don't know how much weight it carries in the scholarly community that the entire story of the, the exodus from Egypt was a heavily censored polemic 
about the Babylonian government. And that you couldn't say Nebuchadnezzar, you know, was going to be overthrown by God because Nebuchadnezzar would kill you. But you could say the ancient Pharaoh of Egypt, who nobody knows and nobody remembers in the year 600 or, you know, 586 BCE, that Pharaoh was overthrown by God. And the readers would know that they were really talking about the tyrant of their own time, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Long answer, short question. That only means I love the question. Let's read a little bit more. A chat window. I'd like to see the movie that shows this version of the sea crossing. <laughs> yep, Trish, so would I. With the ice water and the little dispenser. I like the little ice, the, like the fresh water dispensers from the wall of ice, right? Isn't that it's just, oh, here's my little ceramic jug. Okay, we move on. You're, and many of you are saying, oh, thank God. We've read one line of text today. Here we go. Um, with 10 trials did our ancestors try God, blessed be he, blessed be God, as it is said, and they have tried me these 10 times and they have not listened to my voice. Aha, so we actually have a Torah reference to 10 here. How convenient for the rabbis. The Hebrew is Shinemar in Numbers 14. Vayenasuoti, they have tested me. Ze eser pa'amim, there's the word 10 again. Eser pa'amim, 10 times and have not listened to my voice. Now, if the Torah says that the Israelites tested God or tried God 10 times, the rabbis immediately seize on that as the surface irritant out of which they can produce a midrashic pearl. Now you see why I needed to go into depth about that metaphor. Now I can just use it and you know what the heck I'm talking about. How so? Well, it says you have tested me these 10 times, but if you're looking at Numbers chapter 14, it doesn't tell you what the 10 are. So uh, let me show you. Uh, I'll just call up on our trusty Safaria window. I'll open a new tab so that we can look at Numbers chapter 14. Um, anyone know offhand what's happening in Numbers chapter 14, by the way? It's an infamous passage of the Torah. So this is the story of the spies. The, tw the 12 spies that were sent out at Moses' charge to explore the land, the promised land that they were about to enter, conquer, and inherit, 10 of the tribes, spies, 10 of the spies come back and say, yeah, it's a great land, great produce, but the people who live there are fearsome, their villages and towns and cities are heavily fortified, they will eat us alive. Um, and only two uh, rebuke that critique and say, no, no, no we can surely do this with God on our side, right? Uh, that's Joshua and Caleb, Joshua who will become Moses's handpicked successor. So the people are, are weeping and what have you. And let me just remind myself, what is, the, what is the verse we're looking for? It says Numbers 14, 22. So I'm gonna just skim down a little bit. Um, everyone can see numbers here though. Yeah, okay. Um, so God is angry at the Israelites who have broken faith and who want to go back to Egypt, right? They, they say, no, 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 we can never conquer the promised land. The people are too scary. They looked, we looked like grasshoppers to ourselves and we must have seemed that way to them. One of my favorite lines in the Torah, the grasshoppers line. We looked like grasshoppers in our own eyes and so must we have looked to them. If there was, if there was a better statement about the withering effects of poor self-esteem, I do not know it. Um, the God says, I'm going to destroy all of you. I'm really upset that you've broken faith. Moses says, no, 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 don't do that. Um, Moses begs God to, to, to grant pardon. And God says, Salachti kidvarecha, I pardon as you have asked. Very famous line, by the way. Famous because it is adopted into the High Holiday Machsor. And it's re recited many times, including right after Kol Nidre. After we say Kol Nidre on Kol Nidre, which will be the night of October 4th, 2022, mark your calendars. It's going to be a great, great service. Um, <laughs> um, on Kol Nidre, we recite the, the Kol Nidre prayer, which uh, annuls vows. Um, and then we quote God, who says, I forgive as you have asked. In other words, it is our invitation to God's forgiveness that prompts God to forgive. 
Uh, anyway, moving on from there. Um, nevertheless, as I, uh, but there's more, which is not quoted in the High Holiday Prayer Book. However, as I live, and even as my presence fills the whole world, none of those involved, none who have seen my presence and the signs that I have performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and who have tried me these many times and have disobeyed me shall see the land that I promised on oath to their fathers. None of those who spurn me shall see it. So right after God says, I pardon, God punishes. It says, however, if you were among the generation of those Israelite slaves who lacked the faith and the courage to enter the promised land, you will never enter the promised land. You will die. Your corpses will drop in the wilderness and will be eaten. That's, that's all part of this extended passage. But notice what's happening here in the text. Who have tried me these many times. Now, many has a little asterisk. Why? Because the text actually says you have tried me 10 times. Now, why would a translator choose not to use the word 10? The answer is because in biblical writing, numbers don't always mean what numbers mean. Numbers do not carry only a numerical significance in biblical writing. So this is a bit of a brain bender. Let me briefly explain. There, there are many times in the biblical literature where the narrative appears to use what's known as an etiological number, E-T-I-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, etiological, which simply means that the significance of the number is not primarily numerical. After the seven days of creation, seven appears to be an etiological number that signifies creation, created, or a complete set of something. So it is not coincidental that many of the pilgrimage, that the pilgrimage festivals of Sukkot and Pesach in the Bible are seven day festivals. It's not just a number pulled out of thin air. Similarly, 40. It rained for 40 days and for 40 nights, or Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Many translations that want to focus not on the literal dimension of the text, but on the idiomatic rendering of the text in their work as translators will not actually say Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. They will say what this really means is Moses was up there for a long time. The Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. They wandered for a really, really long time. That's all. And therefore, when God says, you have tested me these eser pe'amim, literally 10 times, it doesn't literally mean that there are 10 times when the Israelites tried God or tried God's patience. It just means many. We do this all the time, by the way. I have a thousand things to do this week. No, you don't. What, you counted? Right? That I couldn't believe her Facebook post. It got a million likes. Come on, it didn't get a million likes. It got 237 likes. But it's more significant. It, it is a figure of speech. It conveys something beyond numerical significance, etiologically, to say round whole numbers like a hundred, a thousand, a million, right? Oh my God, I have to make a hundred calls tomorrow. We do it all the time. We're not aware of it because it's, it's a linguistic feature of most languages. Okay, following? But for the rabbis... <laughs> If the Torah says that the Israelites tested God 10 times, you know what the rabbis are going to do. They're going to go back to the text and say, I now need to find the 10 times when the Israelites tested God. And that's exactly what happens here. So if you're looking once again, uh, oops, sorry, that's, uh, that's numbers. So let me just retab here for Pirkei Avot chapter 5, um, the 10 times. Sure enough, somebody has done the homework for us, which is lovely, is it not? This is why I love Sepharia. The 10 times that the children of Israel tried God are as follows. One at the sea, chapter 14, Exodus 14, 11, at Marah. Um, that's the first place where the water was bitter and Moses used a stick to sweeten the waters. That's actually a motif that comes up many times. It's not only the most famous story of striking the rock. Uh, in the wilderness of Sin with the manna, the people fetch that we have only mana to eat. Again with the mana? <laughs> really? More mana? 
we couldn't have chicken for dinner. And God says, you want chicken for dinner? I'll give you quail. And enough quail uh, is produced to, to literally, it says it will come out of your nostrils. At Rifidim, with the golden calf, of course, at Tavera, at Kivrot Tavera, and in the wilderness of Paran. You want to go back and look at it, go on Safari. Uh, you can actually have a jolly old time looking up all of these different references. They're all there 10 times when the Israelites tested God. However, a skillful or perhaps willful reader of the text will say, yes, but what about all of these other times that aren't being counted? And the answer is yes, but the rabbis need to get to 10. Joe. Oh, unmute kindly. Yep, still, you're still muted, Joe. Uh, there you go. Number two referred to something mara. Is that a der derivation of the word for moror in the uh, It is. Talk about, you know, it is Christian actually. You mentioned bitter. Yeah, mara means bitter. And marir, maror, marar is, the, um, is from the same root, uh, right. mem resh resh, which means to make something bitter. Thank um, you. So maror means bitter stuff. Um, and mara, even the name mara. Uh, is mara Steiner with us today? Oh, too bad. She's often with us. Mara Steiner, um, sorry, your name means bitter. <laughs> Miriam, also from bitter, bitter water. Yeah, what can you do? Um, not everyone can have a name like Yonatan, <laughs> which means a gift from God. And, and I would say Jonathan is like the only biblical character who's just really nice. He's not really a problematic character. Like all of you Davids out there, I always wonder about David. I'm like, yeah, strong leader, but also adulterer and murderer. Hmm. It's a very popular Jewish name for an adulterer and murderer. Michelle, you want to chime in on this? Or are you going to tell me just move on already? I was going to comment about being off topic. Thank you. <laughs> Here we go. You're good for that. <laughs> okay, the next text. Um, more on 10. And I think that now, now we can go a little bit more, a lot more quickly. You'll, you'll see. Because now you've got the form. All right. So 10 wonders were wrought for our this one's just fun and russell's gonna russell i'm gonna try and keep you from rolling your eyes asara nisim nasu la avotenu beveta mikdash 10 miracles same same syntax here 10, 10 miracles were wrought for our ancestors in the beit hamikdash the ancient temple one no woman miscarried from the odor of the sacred flesh i'm sure that wasn't on your mind but we'll do a what do all these things have in common the sacred flesh never became putrid. No fly was ever seen in the slaughterhouse. No emission occurred to the high priest on the day of atonement. We'll get back to that. The rains did not extinguish the fire of the woodpile. The wind did not prevail against the column of smoke. No defect was found in the omer, which is the barley sheaf offering, or in the two loaves, the shoe bread, S-H-E-W bread, the bread that is just for show or in the show, oh, sorry, the two loaves are a different uh, ritually presented bread, my bad, or in the show bread, the people stood pressed together yet bowed down and had room enough. So they were crammed in like sardines in the holy temple, and yet there was room for everyone to daven. Never did a serpent or scorpion harm anyone in Jerusalem, and no man said to his fellow, this place is too congested for me to lodge overnight in Jerusalem. 10 miracles that no Jew complained about crowded lodging in the hotels in Jerusalem. Now, what the hell is happening here? <laughs> what is this text? Where does this come from? All right, Dad, you wanna, you wanna throw out a, a possible response here? This must have to do with the um, inviolability of, of the sacrifice made by the priests, how they were never adulterated, never anything other, than, than sacred to the degree that, that God commands. Beautifully expressed. Right. Okay, so what's happening here is that the rabbis have a visualization and an inherited tradition of sacrificial cultic worship in Jerusalem administered by the priests. Right, we all know this. Okay, I don't need to do a long exegesis on sacrificial worship. If you've been studying with me long enough, you ever read any Torah, you know, 
a good chunk of the Torah is devoted to sacrificial worship, slaughtering animals at the slaughter site, namely Jerusalem, administered by the priests, uh, chopping up the meat, the flesh of the animal into various sections. Some of it gets burned and goes all the way up to God. Generally, the, the fat and the bones and the parts of the offal, the parts you wouldn't eat anyway. The choicest cuts of meat are actually food for the priests and the priestly families. And the rest is an offering that variously can go to the poor or be distributed outward from there. All right, so that's sacrificial worship. And it, it was a big deal. This is how the people communed with the Most High. And, you know, in ancient times, the Bible may actually have meant it literally when it says that God smelled the pleasing odor of the burning flesh and was sated. A God who smells, a God who maybe even eats. Um, at some point, there seems to be a vestige of a, of a highly incarnate deity who wants us to slaughter animals, burn up their meat, uh, their flesh, and therefore propitiate God. The rabbis visualize this and they need for it to be an institution of sacrificial priestly, uh, of, of divine purity, right? So a lot of this is about rabbinic notions of purity, especially since it no longer exists. The sacrificial cultic system by the time of the rabbis is only, only exists only in their imagination or their collective memory and their literature. So they read about it, but the rabbis were observers of real life as well as we have ourselves observed many times. And they say, well, what the, how could this be? How can you have this institution of such purity in a real world of flesh and meat and bodily emissions and corruptibility? And so the rabbis are going to say, well, that was part of the miracle. The sacrificial system was so pure that the meat never got tainted. The aroma of burning flesh all day long and all night never caused a woman to miscarry. Like it, it never made a woman just so sick to her stomach and pregnant women are known to have sensitive uh, stomachs, are they not? So no woman ever miscarried because she was just, and, and by the way, a lot of prenatal care for, for, the, for the mother that's carrying a fetus is about not having her vomit, right? That's the main reason that women shouldn't be eating sushi. It's not because sushi is inherently harmful to, to the baby. It's because you can become violently ill if you, uh, you know, eat tainted, tainted raw fish. And you don't want to do that when you're carrying a baby. So no woman ever miscarried from the noxious aromas of burning bones and flesh all day long. No fly was ever seen in the slaughterhouse. A fly would have uncoshered the slaughter. Fly gets inside of the, the cow. Well, you can't, you can't, that meat is no longer kosher because the fly is not kosher. No emission occurred to the high priest on the day of atonement. In other words, uh, he never ejaculated. We didn't have an inoct a nocturnal emission um, or other self-induced emission. Now, why? Because the priest needs to remain in a state of priestly purity as defined by the book of Leviticus. There is a specific restriction against, uh, not, if a priest uh, has a nocturnal emission, he has to go and purify himself before he can go about his priestly duties. That's actually in the Torah. The wind did not prevail against the column of smoke. In other words, the smoke went straight up to God. So it wasn't like all over the place, which would have been the wrong visual for how sacrifice was supposed to connect the earthly domain to the heavenly domain. The people stood pressed together. No defect was found in any of the grain offerings. They were perfect loaves of bread and barley offerings. The people were pressed in like sardines and yet they were all very nice, polite, able to bow down together. The ritual was choreographed perfectly. Never did a serpent or scorpion harm anyone in Jerusalem. The rabbis are living in the real world. They're like, we live in Israel. There are all sorts of nasty little creepy crawlies, but not during the time of the temple when the temple stood. And no man ever said, oh, this place is so congested. I can't stay overnight in Jerusalem. Remember that Jerusalem is the, is the central shrine. And when I mentioned pilgrimage festivals a little while ago, that is exactly the point. You had to make pilgrimage 
either with your cattle and grain and fruits and veggies, or you would travel with money and purchase them in the marketplaces surrounding Jerusalem. And those of you who visited Jerusalem, Russell, recently know that the, the central shrine, the Temple Mount, or where the Al-Aqsa Mosque and, it's, uh, and the, the, um, the, the dome uh, are presently, uh, is the central shrine for the Jewish people. That's where the temple once stood, but it's surrounded by markets. The idea was that in the ancient world, if you were going to do your holy business, why not spend some money in Jerusalem too, especially if you're traveling from afar? And this was not just the uh, epicenter of religious life in Jerusalem, it was also the epicenter of mercantile life in ancient Israel. Thoughts, comments, questions? This all makes sense? The deeper question is why? Why do the rabbis need to do this? What's the bigger project here, in other words? Why all of this? Why are they teaching their disciples to memorize 10 miracles of purity that are associated with the ancient temple compound when there is no temple compound anymore? What, what, like, what, what do you think that's all about? Audrey. I don't know, but maybe the general populace was getting sloppy about adhering to the principles and the rules and the laws. All right, so one could simply be, uh, remember the good old days when everybody you know, uh, lived in this kind of, or, or worshiped in the state of priestly purity? Maybe it is a kind of object lesson or cautionary tale for the current population. I like that. Um, Michelle. So I've got a couple of possibles. So first, first of all, I like the characterization of these as mnemonics. Personally, they don't work for me um, because you have to remember the thing and then translate right. it, which is more than, yeah. um, but that said, it is a common learning technique. It is often used today. Um, the, so I, I, I can see sort of two ways of, say, of addressing your why. The first is that the transmission, transformation of biblical practice cult to uh, rabbinic Judaism required an attempt to make things from, from the text relevant. And so you wanted to study them to try to see how to understand them or reinterpret them for whatever period in which the rabbis, and in this case, the earlier ones, but later on, you know, yeah. Maimonides and Rashi et al. Um, so that they could find some pearl that could be applied to their new worlds, their relevant worlds. The other part of that, I think, is that if this text is so holy and required, um, significant, then study for its own sake also has value. And we're trying to figure out every dot, every comma, every nuance, and I know there's no punctuation, but take that metaphorically, um, every bit of nuance that might be in there because that is part of the process of becoming more holy and following the law. That's great, thank you. Uh, I won't elaborate on that much except to say that, you know, look, I, I see in these rabbinic texts, the genius of Judaism and the impulse of reform. I won't capitalize reform here because it's not a denomination of Judaism for another, you know, 1800 years, give or take. 1600 years. You don't have an intentional, you know, the reformers were very proud in the early 1800s of their efforts to reform Judaism. These rabbis are reforming Judaism, but they won't admit that that's what they're doing. Rather, they want to present themselves as kind of museum curators of the old tradition that they are presenting to their people as you know, in this kind of pristine and glorious condition. So they actually treat the ancient traditions with such extraordinary reverence, even as they are warping 
the events themselves, right? Okay, so I mean, obviously in the most fanciful example, really 10 transparent lanes of ice with dispensers for fresh water when you're crossing the Red Sea, that's bonkers town. On the other hand, this idea of a temple cult that operated in an immaculate state of priestly purity, I think that's their way of saying that in a world without temple, this concept is nevertheless extraordinarily relevant and important to us. Like they're not saying we've moved on from that. The temple was destroyed, la di da, it was sad at the time, but now we have a better way of doing Judaism. What they're actually doing is, it's very sly. Yes, we're going to do Judaism our way. We're not going to reinstitute a priestly cult of sacrifice, God forbid, but we're going to venerate the way it was done to such an extraordinary point that people will stand in awe and say, I long for the days when the temple stood. Okay, Dad. I'm uncomfortably reminded by these last couple of um, uh, sections of uh, Mishnah of uh, many hours in pre-med and med classes, memorizing lists of things which may or may not have had anything to do with my eventual career. But, you know, all the steps of the Krebs cycle, the ostia of the cranial nerves, you know, all of these things that you had to you had to achieve the discipline to be able to inculcate these things in your memory. And right. in its own way, you know, since I, I found that much of learning how to be a doctor was learning how to speak a foreign language. A lot of it was just knowing what things meant mm -hmm. and how to get there and how to develop the self-discipline to get yourself to, to master the material. It, it, in like fashion, maybe for the young aspiring rabbi, this was like, you know, comes at the end here, it's sort of like the index. He said, we want you to look these things up now and memorize them because this is the kind of thing that rabbis and their scholarship are expected to know, so learn them. A hundred percent. It's a great analogy. And, uh, and I'm sure it is true for our lawyers as well, right? There's a whole bunch of arcana, which is a subjective evaluation that you probably had to just commit to memory and you can, and a lot of it's in Latin. Um, and for rabbis, the same thing. I was thinking like there's a mnemonic around um, the orders of the Mishnah. So there's a mnemonic that is in song form at the end of the Passover Seder. We talked about it last week. Who knows one? I know one. One is our God in heaven and on earth, right? And you should be able, you know, after a while to go, who knows 13? 13 are the attributes of God. 12 are the tribes of Israel. 11, the stars in Joseph's dream. 10 are the, um, can I not get 10? 10 Debraya, 10 of the commandments, nine of the months of childbirth, eight of the days before circumcision, seven of the days of the week, six of the orders in the Mishnah, five of the books of the Torah, four of the matriarchs, three of the patriarchs, two of the tablets of the covenant, one is our God in heaven on earth, right? That's base memorization. I never tried to memorize that, just know it by doing it. But the thing is, rabbis are then expected if somebody says, well, what are the 13 attributes of God? <laughs> you say, oh, okay, I can do that. What, what are the 12 tribes? All right, well, you know, I know that because I performed in Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat and they're rattled off, you know, Naphtali, Asher, Dan, whatever. Okay. Um, when you get to six of the orders of the Mishnah, I was thinking, can I actually name the orders of the Mishnah? And then I remember there's another mnemonic for that. It's called Ziman Nakat, which is a, uh, which means a time for planting, um, but it's an acronym. Ziman, Z for Zoraim, meaning seeds, Moed for seasons, Nashim for women, Nizikin for damages, uh, Kiddoshim for the Kuf for Kiddoshim, and the Tet is Tehorot. So now I know that the orders of the Mishnah are, you know, Zaman Nakat, Zra'im, Mo'ed, Nashim, Nizikin, Kiddoshim, Tehorot. Like, and those are just things like, do I really need that for my day to day job? Is anyone ever going to quiz me on what exactly are the six orders of the Mishnah? I don't. I could probably be a very successful rabbi if I couldn't do that, but it is everywhere agreed that rabbi should just know that. Okay, Russell, your thoughts, since I probably teed you up for this exactly, right? <laughs> well, as you know, I am not a fan of numerology. 
and have always regarded numerology as the gateway to superstition. Uh, but I am always moved by the fact that our tradition has never excised out the passages of the Torah that we consider to be obsolete, whether it is the sacrificial cult or how to treat, deal with uh, scaly afflictions or, or, or whatever. And I like the fact that the rabbis, as they are formulating you know, a, a new piety, a new way of worship, uh, even the concept of prayer, are in the first place telling us it's not unrelated to where it all comes before. They're inviting us into a relationship of metaphor with the past. And I th uh, that is something that I admire about our tradition. And I, uh, I hope we will always carry forward. I think it demeans our ancestors to think that they have nothing to teach us or that we live in a more enlightened age, you know, you know, gosh, we had the Renaissance and, and, and the Enlightenment. And so we don't really have to take seriously the practices and the messages that came out of an animal sacrificial cult. Mm -hmm. And while I would never advocate going back to that, inviting us to find metaphor, even in things that are so disparate from our current reality and our current value system is a tremendous source of enrichment. Thank you so much. Uh, can you think of one thing, Russell, that you learned in law school that you just had to memorize that you don't really think has any practical value? Well, it doesn't have any practical value. Um, I always loved the uh, the rules for property interests in wild animals. There's a There was an old case from England about a parrot that escaped from the London Zoo and somebody found it and wanted to keep it and the zoo wanted it back. And the question is, is a parrot a wild animal or not a wild animal? There it is, uh, there it is, you know, thank I, you. I, I think things like that are esoterica like that is just fabulous. And every discipline has it, so okay. We move on to our last, um, I was gonna say midrash of the day, which it truly is. Um, it's the last Mishnah of the day, but it is Midrashic. Now you know. And it is my very favorite of all of the Mishnayot in Pirkei Avot. So yay, okay. Asara divarim nivre'u be'erev Shabbat ben hashemashot. Now this is really interesting. Ten things were created on the eve of the Sabbath at twilight. Ben uh, hashemashot literally means between the suns. And a lot of people have wondered, well, what does that mean? And it, it definitely means twilight. My uh, professor, uh, Dr. David Aaron, my professor of biblical studies, this is a biblical phrase, ben hashmashot. That's actually the time when you're supposed to go outside and slaughter your Passover lamb. Ben, you're supposed to go out at twilight and slaughter the lamb for the Pesach, according to Exodus chapter 12, I think. Um, Ben Ashmashot, he says, is picture a horizon, right? There's the sun uh, there on top of the horizon. It is the beginning of sunset. And this is the sun after sunset. Ben Hashmashot is when the sun is this, right? It's halfway. The sun is bisected by the horizon line. Dr. Aaron suggests that Bein Hashmashot, literally between the suns, means when the horizon line bisects the disk of the sun. That is twilight, that exact moment. Why does anyone care about this? Because that's what biblical scholars care about. That's his arcana. Okay. Um, 10 things were wrought or created on the eve of Sabbath at that very moment, at twilight. What Sabbath? Which Sabbath? There's one every week. The first, the first Sabbath. The very the first. first. So day one, two, three, four, five, six, the sun is setting. We know what God does, or more correctly, does not do on Shabbat after the six days of creation. God takes a, a Shabbat shluf. God rests. This text is going to provide 10 things that God made at the very last minute that aren't mentioned in the Torah, right? That's been our, our connecting thread for today. Things that rabbis need to know that aren't mentioned in the Torah, but nevertheless exist. Here they are. 
the mouth of the earth. Well, that's weird. What does that refer to? We'll talk about it. The mouth of the well, the mouth of the donkey, three mouths, the rainbow, the mana, the staff, meaning Moses's staff, the shamir. This is going to be real esoteric if anyone knows what a shamir is. The letters, the writing, and the tablets. Now, some also say demons, the grave of Moses, and the ram of Abraham, our father. And that's three. And finally, number 14, some say tongs made with tongs. All right, this is a completely bizarre text. And yet, by the time we leave in 10 minutes, its meaning will be revealed. Dad, do you want to take a first crack? Well, real quickly, these are all miracles. These are miraculous okay. things. Great. These one are miraculous another, things. You can, you, can, you, know, you, you can cite the passages in the Torah. I'm guessing the mouth of the donkey is uh, Balak's uh, ass. Bilam's ass. The, the, the Gentile seer right. Bilam, commissioned by the, by the, uh, by the uh, sorcerer uh, Balak. Right. Sorry, Bilam is the sorcerer, commissioned by the enemy king Balak, rides right. on a donkey, Donkey doesn't want to go on the mission. This is Numbers chapter 23, I think. Um, Dad, you know this passage well. So the talking donkey passage, if, uh, if anyone's familiar with it, then this is immediate. Right, exactly. Where yeah. on earth do you get a talking donkey? This text says it was part of God's design in the initial work of creation. It was not an aberration that just popped up. Oh, talking donkey. Um, many of you may be familiar with uh, a term from video game design um, called the Easter egg. An Easter egg is where a designer of a video game or an app programs into it a secret function or feature that can only be discovered either by persistence or accident. Like all of a sudden, if you crawl into this dark corner in the maze, you'll get a, a box of treasure. It's an Easter egg. And, and designers... All designers of video games and apps hide Easter eggs in their games, and avid gamers find these things. So these are the Easter eggs. I know it's a terrible religious mixed metaphor here, but these are Easter eggs that God built into the design of creation. Later on, centuries or millennia from now, you're going to need a talking donkey, or the story of Bilam and Balak doesn't work. I'm going to build it now and program it, thinking like a video game designer, to go off in the 23rd chapter of the book of Numbers. All right, so that's one that's pretty obvious from this text. Now we should be able to pinpoint what are the others. We don't have to go in order. Can anyone else find another miracle that God pre-programmed into creation here that you're familiar with? The ram of Abraham comes from the Yake dot. Right. How could it possibly be that exactly the thing that Abraham would need to save Isaac from doom would be just there waiting, it was a miracle from God. The text does not describe it as a miracle from God in Genesis 22. The rabbis want you to understand that a miracle means that God designed it and programmed it into creation, not that something that bent or broke the laws of nature suddenly a miraculous ram at the very moment of the sacrifice of Isaac could not be a coincidence. Good, give me another one here, somebody else. Some of these are familiar. I know they are. Don't, don't be embarrassed. The worst that happens is you get it wrong. The flood. The flood, right? Um, where is the flood here? The, rain, the rainbow. The rainbow, thank you. The reference to, the, so the flood itself has an explanation, right? God, it says, opened the floodgates of the heavens and the earth and all the water came out. But the rainbow is, in other words, they're saying, how could this thing just appear? God built a rainbow on Erev Shabbat just before the sun went over the horizon line on the first week of creation and God took a Shabbat nap. The rainbow was built and ready to deploy at the end of the Noah story. Good. Something else. Mana is an easy one, right? The letters, the writing, and the tablets are all part and parcel of the same thing. Yes. I mean, where, the letters... Where, the writing and the tablets are all the revelation at Sinai. 
the revelation at Sinai, the tablets of stone carved by the very finger of God. How could this be? And there are all sorts of other things. Like if you know um, ancient biblical script, there are lots of full circles and things like that. You can't actually carve a complete circle. Uh, the letter O is very hard to carve into stone because it has a, a perforation or an aperture, right? Think of carving a jack-o'-lantern. If you want to carve an eye with a pupil in it, you need a piece of connecting pumpkin flesh or the whole pupil will pop out and you'll just have a big hole where the eye should go. If you want an articulated design for the inside of the eye. So the same thing with biblical lettering, there are all sorts of little articulated inner circles and whatnot that could only be of, uh, created through some miraculous form of writing. God built it into creation and let it wait until Sinai. That's the last three, the letters, the writing, and the tablets. It is also related to the Shamir. Now I'll give the rest. The manna is the miraculous food that nourishes the Israelites in the wilderness. That one we know. The staff of Moses, that's the staff of Moses. How could Moses do all those miracles? He had a magical staff. It wasn't just any staff. It was a Harry Potter staff. Okay. The, the mouth of the earth, anyone know the biblical story? When does the earth open up and swallow oh, a whole Korach. It's Korach, yeah. right? Yeah. There's this awful scene in which a bunch of rebels uh, associated with the rebel Korach oppose <clears throat> Moses and his leadership. Um, and one of the fates that awaits some of the band of rebels is that the earth just all of a sudden opens up and swallows them alive. Not just a random earthquake. It was a specially designed <laughs> geological feature at that place to be activated at that place at that moment for that purpose. Okay. The mouth of the well. Is that, is, is, is that, I forget which of our patriarchs, is it, is it Jacob when he meets? I was uh, thinking it was Jacob Rachel? as well, where he was able to roll a ginormous stone off of the well with superhuman strength. But according to uh, the Midrash, it's actually Miriam's miraculous well that is reported to have accompanied the people throughout their wilderness journey so that they had water wherever they went. That's why some people at their Seder put a glass of water. At the women's Seder at WRT, there's water on the table for Miriam's well. Um, the, so the well of Miriam is only in Midrash. It's because the very next thing that happens after Miriam dies in the Torah is that the Israelites run out of water. So the rabbis say, aha, these two things cannot be connected merely by proximity to each other. Their juxtaposition must be meaningful. Miriam died, they run out of water. Miriam must have been the source of their water. And so they say Miriam had a miraculous well that traveled with her. And as long as Miriam was with the Israelites, her little well, it's like Mary had a little lamb. Miriam had a little well, right? And the well was sure to follow. So the well went with them. Everywhere they went, they had water. Miriam dies, no more water. That's the, the mouth of the well. Mouth of the donkey, rainbow, manna, Moses, the letters, the writing, and the tablets. We did all of them except for one. Demons are demons. The rabbis were really into demonology. We won't get into it. The grave of Moses, by the way, what's problematic about the grave of Moses? We don't know where it is. A, we don't know where it is, and we don't know who dug it. He's up on Mount Nebo by himself. And all the text says is, and he buried him there, which is always interpreted to mean God. Really? God dug a grave? No, God pre-planted a magical grave to appear at exactly the moment and the place where Moses would need a grave. Okay, we're going to get to the last two, the Shamir. Anyone know what a Shamir is besides the name one of one of the prime ministers of Israel? It's one who observes, watches. Maybe yeah, it actually comes from the same root as Shomer. Or, it or maybe even watchful. announces the coming of Shabbos. You would think it would be something as logical as that, but no, that is not what a Shamir is. A Shamir is a magical worm. That, <laughs> it is a magical worm that carved the names of the, ten, of the 12 tribes of Israel into the precious stones that were worn on the breastplate of Aaron the Kohen. How do I know that? Because that's some of the dumb stuff that rabbis have to learn in rabbinical school. 
But you see, that, that's the rabbi version of the Krebs citric acid cycle. Thank you. I was about to say that. Exactly. Much less relevant. Much less. You got to know what a Shamir is. Really? You have to know that there's a Midrash that says that the name, because it says that the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were engraved in precious stones on the breastplate of Aaron, the high priest, which is a lovely idea that when he presented for sacrificial worship, when he stood before God in the ancient tabernacle, in the tent of meeting, he was literally carrying the names of his people on his breastplate. Yes, but have you ever tried carving in precious stones? The only thing you can do is with a harder stone, with a diamond, and they didn't have diamonds. So where are they going to get a thing that can carve the names of the Israelite tribes into precious stones? There was a magical worm. God made it on the eve of Shabbos of creation. And that leaves us with only one more item, which is my very, very favorite. Some say tongs made with tongs. You cannot make a tongue without a tongue. And where did the first tongue came from? It's the Somebody knows the his blacksmithery, right? Blacksmiths in the manufacture of metal tools use tongs. You need tongs to hold the thing over the fire, which gets white hot so that you can hammer it on an anvil and mold it into the shape you need for the tool. But how are you going to make a pair of tongs <laughs> this is this is the Jewish version of the chicken and the egg story, right? Which came first? Where did the first tongs come from? And so the rabbis say here, it was a miracle from God. God made a magical pair of tongs, gave it to the first blacksmith. And by the way, blacksmiths have a mythic place in many civilizations literatures, right? Wasn't one of the Greek gods, Hephaestus or Vulcan in the Latin framing, um, the Roman god Vulcan, the god of smithing? Right, the god of fire, sure, but the idea was harnessing fire to make metal tools was a very big deal for a civilization that emerged out of the Stone Age into the Iron Age and the Bronze Age. Right, this is actually really important for people to understand that these developments in civilization of which they were aware, by the time they're actually living with them, it's been so long that they don't know where these things come from, but they're kind of miraculous. So it's a very fun little midrash to talk about the tongs that were the original tongs. And that is going to be my last comment of the day. Russell, you're on. Well, I love the tongs that make tongs, but for a very different reason. And that is, I think it points us to the very question of creation. You know, we begin, we begin our discussion with, could something have been made from nothing? Right. Uh, All of and, these actually are asking that question. Uh, and this, and this, and this brings us full circle back to the first moment of creation, and that is, what was it fashioned out of? So, Right. And is this creation ex nihilo? I mean, there's so many different ways in which you can go with this text. I like it because it is fun, but I love it because it is extraordinarily meaningful, because it suggests something about the nature of miracles, and that a miracle is merely something unexpected that is already built into the fabric of creation. In other words, there can be no miracle with, if you define miracle as something that deviates from God's plan for the world. Something that just happened as it were supernaturally. What this text proposes is that no, there's no such thing as, I think the logical extension of this text is there's no such thing as a miracle that breaks the laws of nature or that is supernatural. It's all natural in the sense that it all comes from the same creator. And with that, my friends, we end our session for the day. I hope I will see a number of you, uh, or I won't see you, but I hope you will tune in uh, either in person at the temple or uh, uh, tune in to the live stream on wrtemple.org at around probably 1.15 um, for my uh, walk through Jewish texts that um, express how our tradition relates to uh, abortion. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, have a wonderful day. And I do hope you'll join us tomorrow. Um, rain or shine, certainly not if you're unwell. Um, but come, we have a, a beautiful service that is scheduled to be outdoors, where we will say thank you to Rabbi Levy and thank you to Rabbi Reeser. And um, it's going to be a really, really nice evening, 615 Friday night. Is this our last midrash, John? Uh, our oh, last midrash yeah, this is our last one for a while. We're going to reboot um, in, uh, in summer. So stay tuned. I'll, I'll send a note. Okay. Thank you. Yashikala.
Thanks. Rukia, bye-bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.